Dhananjan, now you can start speaking. Okay. Sabko Namaskar. We are here to reflect this evening on consciousness. The word consciousness has been used by different thinkers, speakers, writers, scholars, and so on. Unfortunately, in two or three different ways. The meaning that they attach to the word consciousness is not quite the same. We will look at those multiple meanings. However, it is interesting to notice that today Around the world, there is increased interest in what is called consciousness studies. Whole seminars, workshops, conferences are held on consciousness. Broadly speaking, we don't regard a table or a chair or a stone to be conscious. We human beings are conscious. Animals, birds, crawling worms, little insects, all these are conscious. So what is this consciousness in us, the living beings? When we reflect on it, it seems that this principle of consciousness, which is unique to life forms or living beings, is something that has a lot of potential for research. I came across a quote by Nikola Tesla, Nikola Tesla, who died in 1943, was a great physicist. And he said, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. Science has existed for many centuries. So Tesla made the statement that in a single decade, science will make more progress than in all the previous centuries. The day science begins to study non-physical phenomena. So when you use the expression non-physical phenomena, obviously even mind, psychology, and various psychological experiences, etc. come into the picture. And probably something that is even subtler than the mind. What is subtle? In philosophy, one of the definitions of the word subtle is more pervasive. You put a drop of water on the table, it occupies some space. If the drop of water boils and becomes vapor, that vapor spreads, that gas, gaseous form spreads far more than the drop of water which you earlier dropped on the table. So gaseous existence is subtler, liquid existence relatively is grosser, solid existence is the grossest. 
generally we have such outlooks. So when Tesla said science should examine non-physical phenomena, I guess he was referring to mind, psychology, and consciousness too. In Indian spiritual tradition, the word Chaitanya or Chit is used to denote consciousness. And we Indians are very fond of symbols and various other representations. They say Shiva represents consciousness, Chit, and Parvati represents Shakti, Prakriti, energy, matter, and so on. Interestingly, in science, we very often discuss the two camps of matter and energy. So, shall we say, consciousness belongs to the camp of matter? Shall we say it belongs to the camp of energy? No. Consciousness is neither matter nor energy. It is something that is aware of matter and is aware of energy. So while a whole lot of physics takes a look at energy and matter, the subject of consciousness studies puts energy and matter, bundles them together, puts them in one camp, matter or energy, either way, one camp, and the second camp is of consciousness. So, various questions arise. Matter or energy, on one hand, and consciousness on the other, are they independent or are they related? Many scientists believe that from matter and energy arises consciousness. They call consciousness an epiphenomenon of the brain. Some spiritualists argue the other way around. Matter and energy arise from consciousness. So, consciousness first, matter and energy later, or matter and energy first and consciousness later is a very puzzling question. It's a very puzzling matter. There was this author of Indian origin who was a professor of electrical sciences or even some physics and so on in uh, Oregon, USA, Amit Goswami. He went to the extent of saying that there is dependence on each other. There is a connection. He went to the saying um, that if a conscious observer looks at energy in the form of waves, those waves or that energy collapses into matter. Consciousness, a conscious observer. What do we mean by a conscious observer? If you and I, even through a microscope or some equipment, watch some phenomenon in an advanced uh, laboratory, we are observing, yeah, we are conscious beings. If in, instead of us, we go to bed, we go home and go to rest, but we have fixed a camera, a very powerful, sophisticated, advanced camera, and the camera is observing certain phenomena. The camera is not regarded as a conscious observer. 
however expensive, sophisticated it may be, consciousness uh, is above the camera. Camera may be sophisticated, but camera is not a conscious observer. Even a little four-year-old child is a conscious observer. How much her intelligence is evolved, has expressed itself, is a different question. So, what is consciousness? We are using this word again and again. In Indian philosophical tradition, consciousness is the knowing principle in all living beings. What is it that knows? First we say the eyes know. But if their mind were not available, eyes will not know anything. Eyes need the support of the mind. So it's the knowing principle. Another question arises here. Does consciousness depend on the brain? Does consciousness reside in the brain? Traditional Indian metaphysics dares to say consciousness mm -hmm. exists on its own. At this moment it may express through the brain but it has its own independent existence. Therefore, the traditional beliefs have always maintained that when the so-called death takes place, somebody dies, consciousness moves from one life to another, one body to another, all that theory of reincarnation and so on. So, what is consciousness and what is our relation to it? To wind up the traditional outlooks, it is said that consciousness free of objects, independent of objects. You can even say consciousness without any object of knowing. The knowing principle alone without having to know anything. If something comes in front of it, it will know. If there is nothing in front of it, it will not know. But whether it knows something or does not know something, its nature is to know. If your eyes are open, you are seeing the sky. For a little while, there may be birds flying and you have something to see. Oh, birds. And after a while, no more birds are flying. Nothing at all. No, no cloud. There is such a simple bright sky. Even then, the eyes see whatever there is. Presence of birds or absence of birds. Now, as I said, to wind up the reference to tradition, in the Vedanta and so on, it is said that pure consciousness can free itself from any real or imagined limitations. And when you stay as pure consciousness, pure observer, or the principle which can observe, which can see, to stay as that pure consciousness is the ultimate in our, call it enlightenment or awakening or spiritual growth or whatever. So, let's stop here with the traditional meanings of consciousness. Krishnaji has used the word consciousness in a strikingly different manner. In fact, he says consciousness is the summation of thoughts, of our beliefs, of our feelings, of our conditionings. It is a summation. So this is different from 
the traditional view where consciousness is like pure light, undifferentiated light. But Krishnaji says, Consciousness is the summation of thoughts, feelings, beliefs, conditionings. And at number of places he has made an appeal that there is got to be a radical change or radical transformation of human consciousness. At places he has said, violence has been a part of human consciousness from time immemorial. That means consciousness is not just pure light in the second usage of the term. It has its distinctions within it. There is jealousy, there is greed, there is boredom, there is loneliness. So many such psychological states of the self are in consciousness. And therefore, we need to work on this consciousness, freeing it, cleansing it up. So, in Krishnaji's uh, teachings, we do not find uh, anything that is independent consciousness, imperishable, avyaya, avyakta, and such words are used. So, to an extent, all these words seem to come together, but at certain places, we don't say we want to bring ending of consciousness. We rather say ending of ego is required. Ending of time is required for one to be absolutely free. On a practical note, if we look at Krishnamurti's teachings, he says things in a more concrete way. He says, can we inquire into cessation of all self-centered processes? There are thought processes which are centered in the self and they build a lot of Self. They add to the self. They add as though some more feathers to the bird called consciousness. Therefore, we are faced with a major challenge how to transform our consciousness. So, pure consciousness is called in tradition the ultimate truth and it's the, uh, it's the ultimate and even intelligence to operate on any subject. You know, our intelli intelligence operates on issues, operates on subjects. <clears throat> our intelligence can work upon, let us say, economics and discover things. Intelligence can work on how natural phenomena occur and the intelligence operating through the intellect and dwelling upon the perplexing but fascinating phenomena of the world can bless us with greater understanding. So, whether consciousness is by itself pure and it appears to be impure because of the play of minds or consciousness is an aspect of the mind, aspect of thoughts. Either way, one thing is certain. The impure elements, the egoistic dimensions have to be cleansed. For that to happen, our watching, our observing has to be A grade. What do we call a certain observation as belonging to A grade? When there is observing without bias, when there is observing without interference of thought, when there is observing with no motive, 
you don't observe to get something purely out of a desire to know what is happening. Just like there are two singers. One sings for getting some rewards from rich people who can probably give that singer many gifts. So one sings for gifts, but another singer could be singing for singing's own sake. Likewise, is it possible that our awareness, our being able to see, our being able to observe <coughs> becomes so pure that there is no self at all, no ego left in it. Because when ego and a number of thoughts and emotions rising from ego come under the scanner of awareness, even Krishnaji has talked extensively of being aware of the movement of the self. So technically, we may say there is the movement of the self and there is something that technically knows what is happening in the mind. In this way, we have certain debate. Lofty thinkers have remarked on the power of observation. One of Krishnaji's very well-known statements is to watch what is changes it. By merely watching what is. Suppose I have certain loneliness. I stay aware of it. Then Loneliness can vanish. Fear, lust, greed, all of them can drastically change, in fact, leave the space if there is watchful observation. Many a time we say we are watching, but there is no true watching. Before even the scenario, situation in front of us reveals its secrets, our noisy mind says, oh, I know, no. oh, I understood, oh, it is this way. Wait, wait, listen, listen. Don't jump to a conclusion, we might say to our mind. But the mind saying, oh, no, I observed, I saw everything, it is like this. A label is put. Therefore, the power of observation is fully tapped when there is pure observation with no interference of thought or word. So, in modern universities, a lot of research is going on. Especially, they believe that consciousness arises from the brain. But from a subjective point of view, somebody is watching from his own side, Interestingly, consciousness is certain subtle, very subtle energy and by itself it seems to be free by nature. But it is the thoughts and emotions which again and again build a notion of who we are, how good we are, or how worthless we are, either way. Thought creates an evaluated self, and that self then evaluates others too. Judging, measuring, all happens through thought. Pure consciousness promotes a whole lot of other forms of intelligence, but by itself, it has no variation. Let me quickly mention a certain issue which is very much in news and that is called the hard problem of consciousness. So if the modern scientists say in certain brain activity the living being, the organism 
gets that quality of consciousness whereby thinking further is uh, empowered. So, the hard problem of consciousness relates to how and at what juncture matter or matter and energy they convert to consciousness. If consciousness comes from the brain, how exactly? I believe there was a student <laughs> who had to prove something in mathematics, nothing to do with consciousness. He made step one, step two, step three, and then in around another seven steps, let's say in this twelfth step, he proved what had to be proved. QED. This is what had to be demonstrated. And his professor was quite excited. Oh, you solved the problem? Some mathematical problem. Step one, step two, step three, all logical. Then he comes to step seven. Step seven, the student has just given some space and written a little question mark and go to step eight. So step seven, what is done there, we don't know. Step six is clarified, but step seven is not clarified. Then step eight onwards, the student goes beautifully and on the step 14 or so, he says, whatever had to be demonstrated has been now demonstrated. And the professor smiled, said, why did you have a step seven where nothing is done? The student said, sir, uh, just one step I have skipped. Uh, that's not so important, sir. The professor smiles and says, don't say it is not important, my dear. I would like you to work on that step seven. Between step six and step eight, you did something and which we do not appreciate logically. And then you say, we demonstrated whatever we had to. Once more, that mathematical problem has nothing to do with consciousness. It's an analogy. In understanding consciousness also, we tend to take a jump, especially resorting to some scripture, some holy book which has said something. And we take that on its face value. We take that with faith. Earlier six steps had some logic, some reason. Step 8 to 16 also has logic and reason. That's how the truth is apprehended. But step 7, there is a jump. That is called the hard problem of consciousness. You may say a hundred things about how the brain works. Very impressive. People stand up several times to applaud your lecture. But up to a certain point, it is worked. And after a couple of minutes, again physics takes over. Logic takes over, chemistry takes over, economics takes over, all the well-known subjects of modern university take over. But there is the step seven in a manner of saying where all are keeping mum. And the student just puts another step on his own. He picked it up somewhere and he puts it there. It's not logically derived. So the hard problem of consciousness is where to a question like, how do unconscious beings turn conscious? What is the leap? What is the step? What is the link? What is the bridge? <clears throat> that is so difficult to answer. People die, their entire body along with the brain is burned. But in certain cases, a child remembers everything A to Z of the two children or two arguers arguing between each other. So, gap is called the hard problem and it is so difficult to fill up. So, now to summarize my words, we have traditional meaning which is pure consciousness called chit or chaitanya or samvit or sometimes Pradhanam, 
Pradnanam Brahma, their Pradnanam. It is the principle of knowing. Empowered by it, the mind, the senses, etc. do know. But the source of their intelligence, the source of their orderly understanding of situations, of Indriya's brain, etc., is in the pure consciousness. Whereas, in another usage of the term consciousness, our entire collection of thoughts, of memories, where certain limitations have come up, that entirety is consciousness, and therefore it makes sense to say we need reform or radical change in consciousness. If there is variety, if there are many components, if certain parameters can be increased or decreased, mm -hmm. then only you can make something go through the so-called transformation. You can't transform something which is homogeneous and has no divisions, no differentiation. The undifferentiated pure consciousness is said to be the basis of differentiated forms and names. Therefore, either way, whether there is a certain intelligence illumining the consciousness or the consciousness on its own uh, examines things, empowers the mind, plays its game. Either way, it is of great value for us to pause here and there. And uh, rather than thinking of ourselves as having such personality, such height, such weight, etc., if we examine what is it in me, in the depth of me, which neither dies nor is born, and it is the key to enlighten, enlightenment, as some scholars say. So this inquiry into what is consciousness, who am I, really speaking, that becomes the matter of consciousness. Let me pause here. Namaskar. Thank you very much, Chidananji. May I request Harsad, sir, would you please give some more reflection on consciousness, please? <clears throat> Thank you, Swamiji. Are you able to hear my voice? Yeah. Very well, very well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me that one's brain can be studied because brain is a matter and the scientists are studying the brain, but consciousness is not a matter and consciousness cannot be studied because it seems to me that consciousness is the ultimate subject it cannot be made into an object. Like when brain is an object and the scientist who is studying is the subject. And scientist has his own consciousness which cannot be studied. He, a scientist cannot study his own consciousness because in that case, the subject and the object are one in, in, in studying consciousness. So that is the difficulty that we cannot study consciousness. Krishnaji says that the content of the consciousness is the consciousness as we know it. So he doesn't say what is that consciousness which cannot be known. And it seems to me that Krishna Ji is using a word like awareness or choiceless awareness or intelligence which can see everything, which can see thoughts, feelings, all the contents 
of consciousness can be seen by this uh, intelligence or awareness. But so this content of consciousness can be studied because it, it comes, uh, it, it can be felt, uh, fear, anger, jealousy, loneliness, or whatever other uh, feelings we have, happiness, all this can be felt and maybe can be studied, but consciousness cannot be studied because it is not an object which can be can be known. It is unknown and that is the mystery. So, and the consciousness, it seems to me, is my own uh, view that these thoughts and feelings which are generated in our brain, they, they don't remain localized within the brain, but they go outside in the form of waves. And similarly, other human beings are also having thoughts and feelings. Their thoughts and feelings are also go out in the space. And then there, there can be an interaction between two human beings, even if they are far apart uh, and they are not able to see each other, what they call telepathy, which indicates that our consciousness, our, our individual consciousness is connected with the consciousness of other human beings. And there is a kind of a connection. And so all this consciousness produced by billions of living things, they are in the space around us. And like the fish, which live in the ocean of water, similarly, we are living in the ocean of consciousness. And in that ocean of consciousness, everything exists what human beings have thought and felt. And sometimes so, something from that ocean enters into our individual consciousness and sometimes some kind of uh, insight may also come from that. So this is a mystery. Consciousness, probably the, the primary consciousness which existed, even it seems to me even before life or universe came into existence and people call it by the name of God, which created all the life on earth. And uh, then from the life came the mind and from the mind came this consciousness. And so we are having only the secondary consciousness. Primary consciousness is not, cannot be uh, seen. It is not something which is a thing, but it is through the consciousness that we are able to see something clearly, whether it is a thought or a feeling. So uh, this subject is very, very um, mysterious. And my feeling is that scientists will never be able to understand consciousness because it is not a subject. It is not an object which can be studied. Okay, so um, I think I have said enough right now. I don't know much about this subject. Uh, thank you very much. Rajendran, sir, please unmute and ask. Rajendran. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Just to be listening to this uh, conversation, just a question oh, I... has come up in my mind. Just uh, I want to. Is it a bit please... louder. Sir, are you able to hear? 
Yeah. Yes, sir. While listening to this conversation, a, just a question has uh, popped up in my mind, that's, that's, uh, which I, I would like to share it with all of you. That is, con there is uh, one is conscious and consciousness. One is adjective and the other is noun. The first one adjective is conscious or unconscious. I am conscious. I am unconscious. How, yeah, how I turn into conscious into uh, becoming unconscious? So that is, that is when the thought interferes, I become unconscious. Con I see, conscious means I am just conscious of the my surroundings. The noise coming, noise uh, coming from the road traffic or from the uh, birds singing or from any movement of furniture in my house, I am conscious of it. But uh, I am, I am not conscious of all all my surroundings when I am thinking something. When thought, when I am uh, caught in the web of thoughts, when there is a self talk, I am listening. Uh, uh, so, so in that sense, that is. Conscious or unconscious. So next is noun, that is consciousness. The consciousness, as we are familiar with uh, Krishnaji's definition, is contents. So when I am conscious, when there is no intervention of thought, that state we can call it as awareness, attention, observation, or whatever it is. Then in that state, when I am conscious, in that state, whether I am adding any contents to the consciousness. When I am conscious, is, am I am adding, if I am, if I am unconscious, I, am, I become unconscious when the uh, thought intervenes. When there is a self-talk, then when there is an inner voice, is, inner noise is there. So at that time, I, I am adding contents to my consciousness. But uh, when I am conscious, attention, observation, so without intervention of thought, I am adding any contents to my consciousness. That uh, I am wondering <coughs> this, this uh, the question, I am just, uh, it's a loud thing, just I want to share it with you. And uh, next is uh, <coughs> But uh, Pariks uh, told about uh, we cannot uh, observe our own consciousness. That is uh, self preferential issues. But can we observe that? that you, immediately the question came to me. Can we, I cannot observe my own consciousness? Whether can I observe other person's consciousness? So, so the third, third thing uh, Pariks uh, told, told about uh, the consciousness of all uh, that is the global uh, consciousness. How 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 the global consciousness affect us? Suppose violent mob. When I am standing in, a, I, when I am caught in a violent mob, the consciousness of that mob affects me. I also become violent. So how can I save myself from turning into violent when I am caught into that uh, uh, group consciousness or crowd consciousness? Thank you, sir. Dinesh Wagmar, please. Hello, are you able to hear my voice? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Today, Swamiji's lecture was excellent. He has already covered most of the points and he has uh, really gone into depth of the subject. So, uh, actually speaking, nothing is left. But still, I would uh, like to say something. Uh, as uh, we understand that JK has changed the, uh, the word meaning and he has used the consciousness word as uh, differently than the tradition. Uh, we will come to it. Uh, what uh, JK said, let us say, uh, let us understand first that consciousness is one which is state of being. Though you may divide it in, in conscious or unconscious. Consciousness is always of the past and it is functioning between the past and the future. 
and that the present is merely a passage of the past to the future. Means actually, if we see uh, in tradition, they say chitta chitta kosh. So uh, chitta kosh means uh, the uh, content uh, or uh, container in which the memory is stored. And uh, because of the vritti consciousness or uh, say energy surge from the uh, your uh, energy surge, that uh, particular memory is get awakened. So he has used uh, chitta kosh for this consciousness. So that uh, we have to understand. Then, uh, so, but means he has used the word differently. So it is therefore a movement of the past to the future. Then content of consciousness is consciousness. State of our mind, of our consciousness is a pendulum swing, swinging backward and forward between the past and the future. Then he says, your consciousness is my consciousness. The content of your consciousness is my content. This also we have discussed uh, on the other day that, uh, uh, of course, uh, the content is same, but the quality may differ. Uh, and that makes the individuality of a person. Uh, then he says, our consciousness is what uh, you are, uh, uh, your beliefs, your ideas, your gods, violence, fear, myths, romantic concepts, your pleasure, your sorrow and the fear of death. Whether any uh, sacred uh, beyond all this, now can this consciousness can be totally changed? That he asks. Can the brain register, which is absolutely necessary and not registered any form of psychological events? Uh, if we see seriously, then we find that uh, uh, normally uh, this conditioning, uh, then uh, your consciousness and uh, the self-knowing, they move around one thing only, that what is your uh, content and uh, what is the problem with that content? And uh, then he asks for the order in that content. And then he says that uh, there has to be some initial order, then you go for the self move. So that is what the, his uh, normal uh, uh, statements or uh, statements are. But dis what dictionary says, dictionary meaning of consciousness is different. They, they tell you with the tradition. The state of being able to see, hear, feel, etc., which is which in Hindi they say sajakta chetna hosh. The state of real, uh, realizing or uh, noticing that something exists. Kisi ke baat ke astitva, kisi baat ke astitva ke prati sajakta. Means by this you know that something is existing. And then for uh, another word which uh, JK has used is awareness. Awareness meaning knowledge, consciousness of interest. So awareness is normally uh, used for the knowledge, whereas uh, he has used awareness for different, uh, different meaning. He has used uh, as a different meaning. JK on awareness says, in awareness, there is no becoming, there is no end to be gained. There is a silent observation without choice and um, uh, condemning from which there comes understanding which is only possible when there is neither acquisition nor acceptance, then there comes an um, existential awareness. All the hidden layers and their significance are revealed. This awareness reveals that uh, creative emptiness, which can be, cannot be imagined or formulated. Awareness implies, doesn't it, a total sensitivity. So here he has used awareness as consciousness, which consciousness uh, uh, traditionally used the word consciousness, he has used the word awareness. Sakshi Bhav in tradition, which we call. Now, I would just like to add to the Swamiji what uh, Swamiji has said in, about the in tradition. In tradition, they say consciousness is Chetna. Consciousness is Chetna, basically. 
by which you feel that you exist or you are live so it starts from uh, you are feeling that you are live they say by uh, they say by one which you feel you exist is because of uh, brahma chetna means when you uh, feel that you exist so this feeling of existence is from because of the brahma chetna since brahma is also fixed another is vritti chetna means energy because of the energy uh, you are able to see the objects another is vritti chetna because of you feel the objects so you feel that objects also exist because of the combination of the vritti chetna and the brahma chetna so brahma chetna will uh, say that the uh, uh, that item is existing and uh, if item has gone then also it will say that item is not existing so in both the cases this uh, brahma chetna will say that whether it exists or it doesn't exist now they also say you you undergo three set states normally which are jagruti swapna and sushupti means awake dream and sleep there is four state which is surya which can be felt in all the three states this is the aim of sadhak to attain this state at this state one can feel directly the uh, creating energy basically at this stage you can directly feel the uh, creating energy which is behind all this however one point is to be noted that this is not god consciousness this is not chaitanya which is known as chaitanya by uh, sadhana sadhak can attain maximum level of chaitanya as per his uh, life assignment which satisfies him or uh, whatever the inadequacy he feels feels inside that will be fulfilled or uh, uh, he get the satisfaction by the uh, this uh, chetna chetna level of chetna which he can maximum attain as per his life assignments there is a state known as uh, turiyati there is also a state turiyati which is uh, like uh, shunya with uh, with uh, content of creative energy it's a like a mixture of uh, shunya with creative energy we can't experience it directly because it is uh, beyond we may uh, to this we may understand uh, close to unknown object which may may understand close to unknown object so one thing is to be understood that uh, this um, uh, state of turiya which is beyond uh, which gives you the feeling of energy uh, behind it either you go by the uh, by the jk method or jk uh, jk teachings or you go by the traditional uh, uh, methods the aim aim is to uh, aim is to attain this energy which is which is beyond and uh, it manifests uh, uh, first it manifests in the energy form and then it uh, manifests as in various uh, objects and all that right now i would like to submit this much thank you swami ji do you want to comment something uh yeah yeah so uh, dinesh ji added as usual some more aspects of consciousness he also acknowledged how uh, i had said there is a traditional meaning where consciousness stands apart whereas uh, krishna ji is um, interpretation of consciousness is it includes and consists of so many memories chitta kosha that word was uh, interestingly brought in by dinesh ji and he began actually with uh, a comment that i had covered a number of points 
I felt he caught me red-handed <laughs> because I actually used uh, some material which had gone into a PowerPoint file, some 15 slides. I had presented a talk at uh, Indrashil University near Ahmedabad on consciousness. So today, as you rightly said, my presentation was a bit academic, going into uh, physics and Nikola Tesla and many things. So it was very good observation on uh, Dineshji's part. I appreciate it. And now to say something, I may have to leave early today, but before I leave, I wish to say that uh, one of the astounding aspects of Krishnaji's teachings is when he says, if you remain aware of thought, if you remain aware of varieties of impulses, urges, maybe fear, whatever you go through, without doing anything to it. <laughs> that is amazing. I, I don't know whether anyone else has said it with so much clarity and so much emphasis. Don't have to do anything at all. Be aware. In fact, Dinesh Ji made a distinction between being aware where that awareness sort of seems to, at least going by the language, seems to stand apart from what is uh, observed. Uh, though it may be a limitation of the language. Uh, because if it does so, if it stands apart, then that will resemble the traditional meaning of consciousness. That which notices, that which knows is consciousness and so on. Oh, my camera went off. So, either way, uh, what I called astounding uh, is... Krishnaji's declaration that if you are aware of whatever is going on without having to do anything, things that need to drop off will drop off. Things that need to stay, these are my words of course, that's what I understood of his teaching. Things that need to stay, which is biological maybe, which is genuine maybe, which is part of human existence maybe, that won't go, that can't go. But whatever is a certain accretion, is whatever has been sort of artificially constructed by the self, will just drop off by being aware. And that's a dimension uh, which probably anywhere, anybody in, in any university, in any institution, if they are studying consciousness, they should in fact explore how this can happen. In my submission, I said uh, this Amit Goswami made a comment. I think a lot of scientists did not accept it. But he says if a conscious observer watches waves, the waves collapse into a particle. You know, energy collapses into matter. That's one kind of astounding statement. But here is a statement of Krishnaji which is, I think, of far more significance by just being aware the necessary changes, necessary transformation, necessary cleansing, necessary purification, all that takes place by being aware. This I would like to highlight in this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now, goodbye, sir. As per <laughs> your promise, you have to leave at 7.05. It is 7.04. Yeah, maybe a few minutes more. Thank you. Thank you, much. Pradeep ji, please. Thank you, friends. I am audible. Yeah. 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 Uh, almost most of the things have been covered by uh, Mamiji and Dinesh and Harsha Bhai. But still, the topic always interests me the way it has been put. Some reflections, some reflections on, conscious, on consciousness. 
So two, two important things are their reflections and consciousness. Consciousness, the way we are explaining consciousness means all those things are understandable to us in some way or the other. So my mind is working and uh, all the things which have been explained are working in my mind. That's why I am explaining that. So reflections stay for some time only and then they are either deleted or they are absorbed where from they came. And if consciousness, as JK said, is if it is content of consciousness, which is definitely only half part of the story, content of consciousness is knowledge, experience, imagination, beliefs, memory, past, all that is content, content. And why, why he might have emphasized on content is because the content is the source of suffering and joy. For all of us, the content that makes a person suffer or in a better position, a different uh, mood. So, uh, different meanings, different minds. This shows that all of us are using, whether quoting celebrities or scientists or philosophers, all those things means all those things we are able to what uh, Swamiji said, the knowing principle. Very interesting. It is in their knower. I am the knower. Of course, knower, the moment I say I'm knowing principle, it is okay. The moment knower comes, then knower, known, knowing, all that thing immediately splits into it. So, when he talked about content of consciousness, he, he talked about Choiceless awareness. So the content is our choices, which make us suffer or feel joy. And choiceless awareness is probably that idealistic. Idealistic because we are usually, usually uh, attached to, observe, observed. Everything, this, uh, this, this is so vulnerable. This awareness, it, it is always getting uh, attached to something, something or the other. It may stay there for some time, it may not, but we are there. And pure awareness is naturally, you can imagine, is peace. And the content is all that what I have already. <clears throat> so where is, is what is reflected? Because in I think Vedant also, that consciousness goes and then takes the form of that object and then comes back to me, what is reflective consciousness. So many theories, so many uh, ways of uh, explaining something. But Harshadji said the subject, it is not an object. It sounds pretty good. It sounds very well. That uh, it's, it's the ultimate subject. But then we would like to give name also to that. Because subject, as long as subject and object is there in my mind, I am still in split condition. The only trying to make it understand myself and convey it or sharing with my fellow beings. So this is the, we are always in a split condition. We are always, I, I think, I feel. So what is reflection? Reflection usually is associated with some rays some light, something like that. So be a light unto yourself, whatever Buddha or JK said. So this must be a light. I'm only just deducting, assuming all these things. So naturally, in so whether this topic leads us anywhere or we will discuss it again in the same way, different uh, uh, schools of thought of consciousness and uh, what someone said about grossness and subtlety. Uh, all, in, all, all these things are working in us. So ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, I don't know what we are uh, 
what we are discussing and why. Thank you very much, friends. This is my state of uh, consciousness, you can say. But it is my, when I use my, naturally it is limited and it is limited, definitely. But I have read all these theories and all these things and Tesla's work and beautifully from Gross to Nussle and Jake, Jagdish and the Bose's work, whether living, non-living and all those things. But then what? Then the best thing I can do is be attentively aware of myself, my actions, in my surroundings with people as uh, certain things are so, uh, you know yourself in re uh, relationships, all these things I, one can feel it. Yes, it is 100% fact. So this is all what I have to say, not much because it is like this. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Harsad Parik, sir, please. Harsad Parik, sir. <laughs> yes, uh, I want to say about uh, Swamiji made a comment about Krishnaji's teachings that when you see what is clearly, like if you see the anger arising clearly, then the anger goes away. But my point is that to see clearly whatever anger, fear, loneliness, jealousy, to see it clearly, one needs to be free. And that is why Krishna Ji says, freedom is at the beginning. Only when that freedom exists, we can see anger clearly as it is. Otherwise, we get caught into a condemnation or justification of anger and so on. So freedom is at the beginning to see what is, whatever coming in our mind, clearly. So uh, that is one thing. And uh, this consciousness, which we are talking about, people, they are talking about three states of consciousness, like waking, dreaming, and dreamless sleep. Three. But mystics, they talk about the fourth state called Turiya, which um, uh, Dinesh Ji talked about. And that is a state of real freedom, uh, seeing clearly what Krishna Ji talks about, freedom, to see clearly whatever is arising, fully awake. That is a state of Turiya. And even Ramakrishna had gone beyond, it seems, this Turiya, when he was kind of a, in a different state, which we don't know. It was like he was unconscious or we don't know, but they call it um, Samadhi or something like that for several months. And uh, he could have died in that state, but there was somebody, a sadhu, used to come and beat him up so that he come to some consciousness and then will drop some food in his mouth. So that was a state which we don't know. And uh, it was, uh, <laughs> we can't talk about it because we haven't uh, felt, felt it. But it is wonderful what Ramakrishna has himself talked about it. And if some people are interested, I will find out and will let you know that it is something amazing state of consciousness. So there are great, great uh, mystery, great potentiality in this consciousness. And we, we cannot talk about it, but it can be felt. Because when we talk, it is just words. We are using words and explaining something. And as Krishnaji says, the word is not the thing. So that thing to see clearly without the word, without the explanation, to see clearly with full awareness, that is a beautiful thing. But 
it is not words. Okay, thank you. I have finished. Vagmare. Dinesh Vagmare. Like, are you able to hear my voice? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we are able to hear. In the Turiya it, it is very yes, it is very interesting. Uh, what in tradition they say in meditation when you go, you don't have to do any chintan, but you have to observe the manam. So what is the difference? Chintan is and manan is actually associated with your breathing. Suppose if you stop your breathing and you will find that you cannot, uh, you are able to think or you, uh, you are able to plant the things. But whatever the uh, uh, thoughts coming to you, they will be immediately stopped. And in yoga, they say, in uh, Hatha Yoga, they say that it is Kumbhak, a state of Kumbhak. When uh, in a further state, even the Kumbhak uh, and means uh, your breathing and this uh, Manan will be separated. But initially, the Manan and your breathing will be associated. So Manan means what? Manan means what uh, the JK is saying that you just observe the thing and you don't do anything. So when you don't do anything means you don't uh, think of anything or don't plan or don't uh, uh, you sh from your side there should not be any action. So this one can try that when he stops his breathing he can still plan, plan the things but he cannot uh, get the uh, thoughts coming from the inside which uh, from the storehouse so, uh, where uh, the thoughts are registered. So it is very interesting that uh, this difference uh, has not been uh, spoken in JK's teaching, but uh, traditionally they have spoken it. And what we, we are saying that uh, be aware of the thoughts and do, don't do anything. You can see, and they, they also call it Sakshi Bhav. So you have to be Sakshi. Sakshi means don't, uh, your moment of uh, your mind should not be in any direction. But just observe whatever thoughts are coming to you. So whatever thoughts are coming to you are definitely of the past or definitely past thoughts. Because whenever you are planning something or you do something that is either in the uh, now or that is either for the uh, future. So this point is also to be noted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pradeep ji, you wanted to say something or uh, a few, few, few words. It yes. was from the because uh, we are talking about as Dinesh also talked about the four mm. states of consciousness: mm. waiting, sleep, sushupti, and turiya. Mm. Right now, we are in which state? Right now, right. So we are talking from memory. We are talking from knowledge. We have borrowed these things from different books and different scriptures. So, because if one, when you know Turiya is a state beyond uh, sleep, uh, dreamless sleep. So, this must be an assumption naturally. Because at that time you won't know that this is that. And you come back to uh, uh, other three states. Either you are, you are continuously feeling or time and again, you feel either this state or that state or that state and imaginary state because somebody has told that there is a state beyond this, which, which cannot be explained. So these things as a memory, as knowledge, we are talking about. And when we say that I have experienced Turiya, so it's again a memory or past or whatever it is. So it is a, it is there as a memory in us, and it doesn't stay there. So these things are alternately the way all these rhythms or different states of consciousness in a, uh, in the lifetime, whatever man lives for, these things are working. But we are explaining these things, isn't it? That there is this thing, and naturally when when we say Turiya. 
then we say you we would like to achieve that state or at least experience Korea, which cannot be experienced. All these things we gather, then we start reading on these things. And again, how to achieve that, how to attain that. All these feelings naturally come. Not much time because uh, Harshad Bhai is also uh, waiting. Let him uh, also say something about it. This is what I say, that this is all memory, knowledge, stories we have heard and we have retained it because of our Vikings and probably experienced or lived experiential learning, something like that. But these are, this is all out of knowledge we are explaining and sharing. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Harshad, sir, do you wanted to say something in Turiyati Tistiti? No, I had raised the hand before, but uh, <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have much to say, except okay. that people in the past, they have expressed what they felt in words, and it may be if we don't, we are not in the same state, it's just knowledge for us. But when somebody also goes through that kind of feeling or uh, experience, then a person says, uh, yes, such kind of things are possible for human beings. And so uh, Krishnaji also uses many words which he doesn't explain, like a blessing or otherness or um, sacred. So, all we can do is to talk about it and that the words which we are using, it comes from maybe past, but it indicates that there is something deeper than just thinking and feeling. And uh, I many times I say that think we are living in the plane of thinking and feeling and in that there is nothing new. Only when a person is able to come out in the third dimension, what we, we can call awareness or consciousness, then we can see clearly everything, what the thoughts and feelings are happening. And uh, we, even a person can say that he is able to see clearly thoughts and feelings, but then the other people will say, but it is the past, you know, you are talking about. So to be in touch with what is, whatever is happening in the present moment, that is, is very interesting. And in that there is a liveliness, there is a creativity, freshness, newness. But then again, somebody will say, these are words only. So we have no other way to express something which goes beyond the world. So that is a difficulty, even Krishnaji or Shankaracharya, when he said, I am not body, I am not mind, I am Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. He felt something extraordinary. And he expressed it in words. And uh, if there is something, a real, uh, genuine experience behind it, then even those words will affect other human beings. As Krishnamurti's words, when I read the book of Krishnamurti, I begin to see clearly what is happening within me. But if somebody said Krishnamurti just talked in words, but what is behind the word, that is very interesting. And uh, all we can do, even I'm using words only, but what is behind it, beyond it, that is very interesting. Okay, I have finished. Thank you. Thank you. I want to. I want to make uh, some comments. Dinesh ji, Dinesh ji, Dinesh ji, let mm -hmm. me let me say something. I am here as a coordinator. Do three people in Turiyati Tishtiti, you yourself, Pradeep ji, and Parik sir. Let me allow to say something. Please. Mm -hmm. so, sure. If you wanted to say something, Turiyati more then you are allowed and go beyond time. Yeah. 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 I would like say to say... Nothing, nothing of these three stages. Okay. 
And I think what Pradeep Ji has already said, Kamlesh Parikh has already said, so say something new, please. Sir, you are using a wrong word basically. Suryatit, we have already discussed that Suryatit state is the unknown state. Surya state is the fourth state. Now this Surya state is subtle state. And this is a basically... So we are repeating the same thing. Because I am wrong, just, you are just, teaching me again the same thing. I don't listen, want the same thing. But listen, sir. I am, I'm, I am I'm, the last one, last one to be taught. Please, please let these, <laughs> let these please. learned people learn something. Please. Listen, listen let, sir. Just listen no, for I am one not minute. Listen. I, I, I don't want to listen to you. Please. I have already listened to you. Enough, enough listening has been done. Enough listening has been done by me. If they wanted to learn something more, I will allow you after 7.30 also. In one previous meeting, I allowed you. I will do that also. But don't try to teach me about these stages because I'm not no more interested in these things. For me, words are words or words are things. Nothing more or nothing less than this. Please, go ahead now. Okay, so these are the basically energy which is the subtle state and it doesn't mean that uh, in the Turiya state uh, all the uh, three states are gone. It is not like that. All the three states are present but they are, they are transformed. Basically, uh, when you say Jagruti state, then also Turiya state is present when you say the the sleeping state, there, then also the Turiya uh, state is present. When you say the sleeping state, then also the Turiya state is present. There is a cascading effect. There is a cascading effect. Means uh, you are to, uh, in Turiya state, uh, only thing is uh, when you say Jagruti, so Jagruti, when Jagruti is there, but uh, um, one day you will feel very fresh, very innocent, very uh, energetic and all that. And other day you will not feel that energetic and fresh and innocence and all that. So why this difference is there? Jagruti state is same. You are you are same, but still you feel the difference. So that difference comes from the basically Turiya state or uh, the energy which is behind uh, working behind uh, all these uh, three states. So that we have to understand. Thank you. Thank you. Kamlesh Modak, now you can end it. Enough is enough now. Please end it. <laughs> enough is enough. Okay. <laughs> Please end it. <laughs>